Hi, I'm uh, Dave March, and this is the uh, Land of Confusion show, our 50th episode, and Yay! we did a little bit of a members poll, and we, everyone wanted Boss Mongo, but he's on vacation, so we went with number two, Doc Bassett. <laughs> what kind of introduction is that? I know, a, a funny one, I hope. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Actually, Shut I don't know if you remember, Dave, when we did our first show together, mm -hmm. we did this, you know, one-hour show, and at the end, I thought, well, that was pretty good, you know, and you concluded by saying... Well, thank you, Dr. Bastia, for joining us. And by the way, everybody, I'm trying to get more high-profile guests on the show in the future, you know. And I, I started, oh, thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> I meant more high-profile guys like you. More like this. Yeah, <laughs> like me, of course, yeah. Well, 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 at least he pronounced the name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud. I, yeah. Favorite was Roosh Babe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we had our very interesting guest on last week. That was a, a, a one for the history books. Was, was that Henry Castan? That was Henry Castan. And I was like, I'm not too sure how this is going to go with Don. Yeah. And Don takes like over half the show. I'm like, oh, this worked out well. You know, I, 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 I watched it. I enjoyed it. It was, uh, Henry did not wait, disappoint. Wait, wait, what did I do? <laughs> well, yeah, you sat was, there for as long as you could. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love, I love talking. You know? Yeah. He's an interesting guy. <laughs> He's an interesting guy, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. A very smart guy. He got it. I mean, I was listening when he talks. Yep. It was, uh, as you <laughs> said in a, a message to me, he said he's read a lot of uh, Nietzsche. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a little too much, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just remember I was reading this. Uh, I don't remember if we talked about this in the, the last episode, but it was somewhere. And basically, the German army in World War I, in order to inculcate a more, world war, uh, more warrior aesthetic, uh, right. basically um, gave free book copies of Nietzsche out to all the soldiers and try to bring that as part of their culture into the soldiers of that oh, war. God. And I was like, well, that explains a lot of what happened in World War II. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Nietzsche, I view as one of the most brilliant minds in history. But if we ever start listening to what he said, oh my God, I mean, it's horrifying. Uh, dude's yeah. brilliant. And his insight in the human condition, I think is extraordinary, but mm -hmm. oh my God. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so uh, why don't we uh, return to our uh, talk? We, we're, I asked you a few ideas for a show, and you're sort of like, so why don't we talk about the stuff that's bounced around the uh, ricochet lately? And uh, one of the first ideas is you asked is like, do we think the differences between Democrats and Republicans are as stark as they seem, or is it just the loud voices that seem to be as stark as they seem? Yeah, it's it's what got me thinking about this. It's been on Ricochet a lot, this type of thing. And um, it strikes me as, I mean, to me, like I also listened to your show a couple weeks ago, Brian Stevens. And, yeah, you know, that's he, the one he, I was thinking of too. Yeah, and he, he he's one that got me sort of thinking about this. And um, he, Listen to the show? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, well, I mean, I just joined the crowd, you know. Um, um, but anyway, Brian appeared to be convinced and Brian, if you're out there, uh, if I misrepresent your views, please correct me. But I, I understood him to say that he felt that sectarian civil war was inevitable, that our country is so divided, there's no way out of this and it can't get better. And what struck me as interesting about that is um, I don't completely understand the division between conservatives and leftists right now. Um, and you would think that if the divisions were so stark that we're getting ready to start killing one another over it, they'd be pretty easy to define. I mean, um, in the Civil War, I mean, there was a pretty clear uh, area of disagreement, you know, and um, and now and 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 what it also interests me that as the left has gained power in America, you know, and I mean, I don't mean just political power, but I mean you know, a, a cultural uh, power and the uh, and uh, the media, corporations, and social media. Uh, you know, as the left has sort of become ubiquitous in our our culture, uh, our culture has become more fragmented and more violent, and, and um. And when you think of the peace hippies, you know, and all the uh, people that believe in collectivism, cooperation, you know, when they say government is the name of the things that we all do together, I mean, all these people, you know, peace, collectivism, togetherness, how are these people violent? And, and, and I, I'm not sure, um, but I, I think I think I know why, at least I have a theory. I haven't gotten my thoughts together enough to actually write a post about it. Um, but hey, since we're talking on the show, I don't have to yeah. knock off together, right? Yeah, no, you hey, don't. Trouble. <laughs> yeah, right. The whole point is, so, 
So anyway, just so do um, a post and include the show. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, let me. If, if, if this makes any sense, then yeah. I'm going to do a post about this. So you As I recall the, you did that last time. Uh, I sort of did. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So just as an example, so my my sister is a physical oceanographer. She works at Woods Hole. She's brilliant. And um, one of her jobs, she she tracks the Gulf Stream. And I don't know if she's still doing this. She she we had this talk a few years ago, but. So the Gulf Stream, you can map it in many different ways. They've got different types of plankton or algae or something that grows in it, and the satellites can see that, and you draw a line where that, that plankton is. Um, it's a different temperature than the surrounding water. You can track that. Um, it's a pile of water. It's about three feet high out in the middle of the ocean. I'm not sure how that works. but um, So anyway, um, uh, and, and there are all these different, different types of fish, different, you know, and there are all these different ways to track the Gulf Stream. And what's interesting is if you draw those lines, those lines are not in the same place. And so we're really not sure what the Gulf Stream is precisely. And that's kind of how I view the divide, our political divide right now. I mean, for a long time, I thought it was like rural versus urban was the basic divide in our country. But I don't think it's nearly that simple. I mean, you got social conservatives versus social liberals. You've got financial conservatives versus financial liberals. You've got uh, libertarians versus religious traditional conservatives. Um, and these are very different groups. I mean, like, like if you take a uh, a, a traditional religious conservative, and they say somebody got stoned, that means they've been reading the Old Testament, right? Whereas when a libertarian says somebody got stoned, they mean something entirely different. Mm -hmm. These these people, in some cases, are not that similar. And um, so um, I, so to me, I, I, I think the defining difference right now might be the way we view the individual fitting our society. I think that's really the central um, division. I think so. So what I mean by that, and if I, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, all right, so I, I mentioned once some, some years ago in a post that, that I, you know, I grew up in a very poor farming community in Ohio, um, and then I lived for 20 years practicing medicine in a very poor area of Tennessee, way up in the mountains. Um, in fact, our, our little town was so remote that the, our mayor said that the only way to get to our town was to be born there. <laughs> How um, small was it? <laughs> it actually wasn't town, that small. It was, it was 10,000 people. That town was people. so small, the rats were hunchback. <laughs> <laughs> How small was it? Oh. oh, we had all kinds of jokes like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so what I liked about those areas was the, the sense of community. You know, I mean, we're all in it together. Everybody, everybody knew one another. There's a few dominant families. There's a few dominant churches, a few dominant schools. And the whole area was to get held together with families, churches, and schools. And, and I, I thought that when I moved to Hilton Head, there would be no sense of community because nobody is from here. Um, I mean, everybody grew up somewhere else and worked somewhere else to make enough money to retire in Hilton Head. And then they retire at 60 or 70 years old. They move to Hilton Head to, for the distinct purpose of playing golf, eating out, and drinking too much. And they do that for 10 or 15 years. And then they leave to be you know they're now they're 80 or 85 they moved to cincinnati to be close to their daughter and so nobody's from here nobody stays here there's really no there's no schools because well we have schools but nobody goes to the ball games because nobody cares their kids aren't in school churches really aren't the dominant force in, the, in our society here i mean that there we don't have families we don't have churches we don't have schools i thought nothing would hold us together i thought i lived here for 10 or 20 years i wouldn't even know who my neighbors were and i was wrong i was completely wrong i was amazed at how what a community-based group this is here and, and everybody's friendly and if i need something i ask somebody if they can't help me they find somebody who can and i found that fascinating even though again it, there didn't seem to be anything obvious that ties society together and i think it's because of the, and it's i've been rolling this around in my head but i think it has something to do with with the importance that western civilization placed on individualism um if you think about it, like socrates uh man i'm sorry i'm really wandering here see I got that's okay that's the the great the greatness okay. of the show. Yeah, okay. We do that. And wander all over the place. Yeah. It's this our competitive might, advantage. It might make sense in a minute. Um, all right. So Socrates would teach by asking questions, right? I mean, he, he takes some redneck guy who had a, a smart kid. He sent him to study with Socrates. And Socrates did not lecture to the students. He would ask them questions. He would listen to what they said. And, and that's amazing. And one of the most brilliant men in the world would ask questions of the students. And, I, um, and the, the Protestant Reformation was sort of a, a macro version of that, you know, where, where you worship the way you want to. Anybody can read this book and understand it. Uh, you do your thing. I do my thing. As long as you let me do my thing, you can do it. And we don't need a dominant central force to tell us what to do. Um, and, and De Tocqueville talked about this. He, he, he remarked in one of his, um, I forget which one it was, but he talked about how he found it absolutely remarkable that somebody could be in a small town in, 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 in um, the United States somewhere 
I'd be going to a Methodist church in town. And if they didn't like how things were going or they didn't like the sermons, whatever, they would get up and they would leave and they would go to the Baptist church across town. And he found that remarkable that they took their beliefs seriously enough to leave their church instead of just going to your father's church, his father's church, like your whole family having generations like the towns in Europe had always done. No, they'd get up and leave if they didn't like it. But they had individual views on how things would go. And, and, and because we view ourselves as individuals and we tend to respect other, others as individuals and we sort of project our self-respect and we, we get along better that way. And the, the flip side, you also, it's hard to improve society without improving people. And, and, and um, sorry, I'm losing my way, but, um, but it, it, it's, if, if everybody's an individual, they tend to work harder at improving themselves rather than if you're part of a group you know, nobody washes a rental car and well, and also mobs are insane. So they don't improve themselves. But nobody works as hard as they might. I mean, individuals work hard to improve themselves because all the benefits are theirs, right? right. So, yeah. so these societies, so individuals, societies based on individuals tend to be wealthy and comfortable, but they also tend to be peaceful. I mean, what, what, what's weird about this is that societies that are based on individualism are, 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 are paradoxically more community-minded than societies that are based on groups. Uh, in, in a tribal society, one that's based on groups or where your membership in a group is more important than your individual identity, everything turns into a power play. I mean, everything's based on jealousies and resentments and it's us against them. And, and you can even have, like if a person, a member of that group thinks independently, he's a heretic. I mean, you know, try being a black conservative right now. I mean, it's, it's brutal. I mean, if you're a member of that group, you are by God a member of that group. So. So everything turns into a power play. It's us against them. Whereas in individual society, you know, we tolerate one another and we work together more easily. I mean, I, you know, I do what I want. You do what you want. And nobody's forced to do anything. Nobody's forced to think anything. Simply because uh, you happen to be a black lesbian, it doesn't mean you have to think a certain thing. So there's less conflict. There's less jealousies and resentments. And there's just less conflict in, in general. So, so, uh, so societies that are based on groups and tribes and, and collectivism, they those societies tend to tear themselves apart and, and they always have. Um, so when I say individualism, I'm not saying every man for himself. I'm saying um, that societies that, that are based on a respect for individual liberty and, and individual rights, those societies tend to be more unified and peaceful. Um, they tend to be more community based, which it seems paradoxical, but I don't think it is because if you have individuals who disagree with one another, they just talk about something else and they continue to be friendly neighbors. And if I need to borrow his leaf blower, I can still borrow his leaf. I mean, we just, we're still friendly, whereas groups who disagree, it rapidly descends into all-out war. I mean, there, it's, a, it's a power struggle, and, and, and um, it becomes more brutal. So collectivism creates fragmented, violent societies, and individualism creates unified societies. And I think that difference between Republicans and Democrats is explaining well, what's happening in our society right now, and I think that's the basic problem we're having, in, in my view. Okay. Well, I think that's really profound. Um... Well, I'll write a post then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Transcribe that thing right there. Just, <laughs> just, just, yeah. just you're, you're golden. Um, this is, I find this really interesting because of because I'm I'm looking at it from a slightly different angle, but I'm seeing the same thing. Well, and, you're in a foreign country. That's probably part of your perspective. Uh, well, in well, I'm in a foreign right? country. He's yeah. in California. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. Technic- We're both in foreign countries. <laughs> I think Don's foreign, country yeah. is more foreign. Um, <laughs> just guessing. <laughs> um, the, um, um, first, I want to talk about what you started with. And I want to connect it to what you ended with. Um, Look. <laughs> because you do better uh, than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just... I just tr- my two comments. I got something to comment on what you started with, and I got something to comment about what you ended with. Mm-hmm. So um, you start out with the differences between the political differences between the parties. Are, is it enough to be a war, uh, a civil war, right? Um, and what are the differences between the parties? Um, I don't believe there are, and I, I've said this before, I, I don't believe there are foundational uh, I, I don't believe the left has a foundational political ideo- ideological position that is consistent and that, that is foundational. They base everything on. I, I don't believe that. 
And um, I think it's more of power, political power, money. Uh, and if you put the political positions, uh, actions, accomplishments of the left and put through a filter of how much money you get out of it, how much money the, the politicians get out of it, um, that guides it. So you could have, like, for instance, you could, because, you know, you, you, when you can, when you can raid the, uh, the, the finances, right? You uh, build bureaucracies, give jobs to your friends, you get uh, payoffs for, for putting business here in, and you just generate an awful lot of personal fortune. And your decisions tend to be based on those kind of incentives, what you can do. You, we, we can put together a, a government agency that's dedicated to solve some problem, but actually makes it worse. It doesn't matter, we're raking the cash in. Uh, it, it's bribable. And so for instance, um, instead of passing legislation uh, for some regulations, we'll pass the, regu the, the legislation that gives a regulatory authority to a bureaucracy. And now that is bribable. And so those regulations, you can make money off of. Now, um, so that's my, that's why I think this is going. And to bring it to your ending point, um, so the communal nature of the party, see this is more, the left is more communal oriented and the right is more individualistic. Well, it seems to me this left is communal oriented only because there's more money in it. And you can, you can work the The, the left, the left has been, money. Can, can been group oriented since Marx, right? At well, least, I don't, okay. at least. Um, let me think about that. This isn't Was, new. Yeah. Right. Like Actually, that's revolution. a good question. When did the, uh, when did when Marx it, affect the left? I, I'm not country. sure the effect, you know, I, I'm, I'm on the contrary. First of all, I, I think Marx was an idiot. I think Engels mm -hmm. was the brains behind the operation. But um, um, but to, to get to your to, uh, more direct question, I mean, I, I think those ideas have been bouncing around for a while. I mean, Rousseau, I think, started a lot of this. Um, but I don't think that the, the basic idea that um, you should have groups of people using the power of their numbers to take what they want from the wealthy few, I don't think Marx came up with that. <laughs> I mean, and if you think about it, the left really hasn't advanced a great deal beyond that basic concept. I mean, there are subtleties, but but you're 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 describing the left sort of as a business operation, which is yes, not yes, yes. which is not wrong. I mean, that, because you're right that the right is is based on a certain set of ideological views, a pretty simple set of views, and the left, if you break it down, it's I, I see where you get that, but I, I don't think that's a new concept. I mean, the, the, what was the French Revolution about? I don't think it was about anything much more complicated than what you described. I'm not claiming it's new. It's just my, my observation. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, and so putting it together, what I found interesting is um, fundamental to communism is that people just do what's good for the group as a whole, right? No. Um, no? I, isn't that what the Marxists... Nobody does. I mean, that, that's the problem, I right? I mean, I know. That's why it but doesn't work. Is, <laughs> yeah. The theoretical. Theoretical. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. The theoretical yeah. communism. <laughs> okay. People do what's good for society as a whole because right. that's the way they are, because that's how they will improve their own. Everybody gets better. But in practice, what the left does is they do the opposite of that. First thing they do is pilfer the treasury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they say what that what these, bus that these businessmen are, are greedy and they take what they want. And then, and then but the politicians now, they're not, those are different kinds of people. They, they don't right. they don't try to seek to risk themselves. That's the theory here. And, and uh, the left is based on that. I, I don't understand how you convince anybody that's real, but they've done so. Your, your point is valid, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and business, you run out of money after a while. In government, you don't. <laughs> right? <That's> close <laughs> to true. Uh, until you do. But yeah, until you do. You <laughs> <miss anything. laughs> Venezuela. But that, that's a, you're right. There's a, a range there. You're right. Fair enough. So, so I, I, I find it like, very interesting as far as the Marxist ideal, the, the Marxist theory, and what the left is doing is just the opposite. You know, the first thing, you know, um, Biden does getting into office is a, what, $4 trillion 
spending mm-hmm. spree, right? Um, that's kind of the, and none of it's going to do any good. Just like the previous, uh, was it like five days after Obama got into office, they had the $1 trillion. Uh, um, well, you see, you got to understand stimulus. $1 trillion was not enough. You have to spend $10 trillion. That will work. Right. Right. If that right. doesn't work, you have to spend $100 trillion. And we're not spending, we're investing in infrastructure, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah yes, yes. In shovel-ready right. infrastructure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I understand yeah. it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's, and that, so that's the, how, how crazy is it? That, well, not maybe. How crazy is it that theoretical Marxism and practical Marxist leanings are the exact freaking opposites? Mm. I'm not sure that I don't have to think nope. about that. I'm not sure. That's that, mine. Yeah, okay. That's, that's mine. Okay. <laughs> think about it. I I'll really, I, I think it, we'll get back to the fundamental of the question was that is, do we really think it's as bad as Brian thought, thinks it's going to be? And I'm not too sure it is that bad. I think it's uh, just natural tendency of sometimes we go through these authoritarian moments and the vast majority of people are, uh, don't know in the long arc of history people will gravitate to law and order and they have these anarchic moments when they kind of forget that and then suddenly they don't want this anymore and suddenly they're voting for napoleon iii to solve it and i think um, that's kind of that you may be right and and I, you know and I, that's gone through my mind you, you you wonder why conservatives are just absolutely going bananas right now i mean because mm-hmm. you know okay the, the democrats control the house and the senate and the presidency that happens sometimes. It's yep. happened in recent memory and, and we recover from it. What's the big deal? Why is everybody so panicked right now? And I think there's two reasons. Um, one reason is there are those who think their last election was not entirely straight up and that it's possible that Biden may not have won that if we had counted the votes only of people who are like, you know, alive and living where they say they yeah. do. Like that. Mm-hmm. If, if that's true, if, and I'm not, you know, just hypothetically here. Yeah. If it's true that the Democrats now control the House and the Senate and the presidency and our election system, that's one reason people are freaked out. They mean, okay, this can't be fixed then. That there's no other. now. The, I think there's another reason though. Exactly. Yeah, I I, I, th- I think there's and, and and you know polite people are too nice to say mm-hmm. that our elections may have been meddled with. That's become a rude thing to say. But I think a lot of people in the back of their mind because that was a really weird election. You know, I mean. Trump was ahead in like six states that were close and he lost all of them. I mean, that's kind of a weird coincidence. Yeah. I mean, so um, so there, I think a lot of people are worried, worried about that. And then the other thing I think too is, is that um, I think that Democrats, it, it, they, they've made a, a strategic decision here to, um, to they, they decided to stop debating Republicans on policy. Um, yeah. they, 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 instead, they decided to, to portray Republicans as simply pure evil. And, 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 and you know, th- th- this is why Democrats spend, spend so much time talking about racism and, and, and climate change. Uh, they, they don't really talk about tax policy and immigration law and stuff. They, they, they want a big thing that they can portray Republicans evil so, so that the Republicans can be destroyed as, as a group. Again, going back to group dynamics that they like. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this works well for the simplistic, you know, good versus evil stories and 140 characters and social media posts and, and, you know, the headline news type of, you know, the the short type. But, but, and it also helps that, you know, uh, mask the fact that Democrat policies don't work. (laughs) You know, so you can just say that, well, our our, our opposition is is simply evil. But the, 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 the one difficulty with that, though, is you cannot convince half the population that the other half is evil. I mean, you cannot do that un- unless, unless you have absolute cooperation from the news media, the entertainment industry, the educational establishment, social media, all the corporations, the FBI, the CDC, the CIA, and have absolutely unanimous support on that and create a, 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 a narrative that cannot be challenged. Only then can you convince half the people that their neighbors are evil. And, and unfortunately, the Democrats do have that. So... This has actually worked relatively well. But the problem with that, though, I think there's a few problems with that strategy, even though I think it probably worked for them this last election. Problem number one is it makes actual policy discussions impossible. I mean, you can't, um, your opponent is not likely to sit down and talk to you about things if you just spent the last four years calling him evil. I mean, if, if Biden actually did invite um, Mitch McConnell or somebody in the White House to talk about tax policy, I, Mitch would probably sit down and say, okay, look, you and I have some stuff to talk about here. You know, uh, you can't do this, you know, um, 
they wouldn't even get the tax policy. So your opponent doesn't really want to listen to you. And then the other problem is your supporters won't be happy about you talking to the opposition because they're evil. You know, what are you doing negotiating with evil? You know, how can you do that? So even if Biden wanted to negotiate with the Republicans, his supporters wouldn't allow him to. So he's stuck. He can't even talk to the opposition. They can't have these conversations because they've been labeled as evil. So, so and, then, and then another problem, with it, actually, if you think about it, another problem is that if Republicans are evil, then if you're a Democrat, you can't, I, I mean, you can't be perceived as being sympathetic to anything Republicans says. So there was, a, there was a great article, a great article I saw by a guy, um, Morrison or Morrison or Molson or something recently. And he had a great line in it where he said, it, it, right now it's, it, it's, it, it's um, better to side with people a mile to one's left than to be associated with anyone an inch to one's right. And, 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 and if, if Republicans are evil, if conservatives are evil, then they will, the Democrats will side with, I mean, communists, uh, just to show how virtuous they really are, mm -hmm. which means the Democrat party moves further and further left. There are no breaks. It's like water running down a hill. You can't stop it. They go for there. So the party can't speak their opposition. They can't negotiate. They can't get ideas from anybody else. They fall, they fly further and further and further left, further and further away from American citizens and, and, and the average opinion out there. So this is doing real damage to, to the Democrat Party, and, and I don't see how it can be corrected, except one, one possibility would be if the Democrats had a strong leader who came forth and he said, okay, look, Republicans are not evil. Uh, we just disagree on policy. I'm sorry if you got the wrong idea from some of our commercials. That was not our intent. They're not evil. We need to go. Okay, that is not going to happen for two reasons. First of all, Right now, this is working, so why would they stop? And the other reason is Democrats don't have a leader. I mean, they don't have a guy who can stand in front of the party, have everybody else fall in line. I mean, is Joe Biden going to take over and then dominate their messaging? I mean, they don't have anybody who can do that. So I don't think this can be corrected. So, so once Democrats started calling Republicans evil and convincing people it's true through their impact on media and what have you, this huge campaign, okay, they're evil, that really painted them in a the corner. And, it, and, and, and that, that's... And so. If you take the fact that our elections may not be completely straight up, and then you add the fact that now we really can't even talk to each other, um, I think there are reasons people are freaked out as they are, and I think there there are reasons people think things are this bad. Yep, uh, I kind of agree. Um, the thing about the media, which I find interesting, is that the media, um, news media, I mean, the the news media, is doing a lot less reporting. Mm -hmm. And they've moved to just um, syndicating press releases, sort of thing, or, or syndicating right. other news sources. Right. And uh, it's um, and, and nowadays, uh, just copying talk talking points, and um, and repeating the talking points. And that's why we have numerous uh, clips of of these uh, different news organizations using the exact same words yeah. the exact same yeah. um adjectives um every time in, in the, the phrases are just exact yes. and i you know we can blame the invention of copy paste but um it's but it's really true and part of it is that the incentive for it it's 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 the the lazy man's way to produce copy right you know you know, you know, oh, you know, Don, you're school. being very charitable there. I don't know. No, I mean, it's the old school, you know, guy, big blank sheet of paper into the typewriter. And that's hard work because you have to come up with original material because, you know, fill that blank page and here and copy paste, boom, we're done. So there's a big incentive. By the way, what Don just First, described is how the Russians are defeating the NSA. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's some. Um, I love the old oh, typewriters. Okay, <laughs> okay that, that's true, Don. But I mean, th th what they're doing is they're just taking Democrat talking points and pretending that it's news. Well, they could yes. do that with Republican talking points if they wanted to, but they don't choose those. Right, I, I, because they're Democrats. I don't think, yeah, I, I don't. I, they used to be sort of. There used to be, to be a veil of of objectivity there. I think they've abandoned that completely. I don't think they even pretend there pretty open right. what their actual job is right now. And it's not news. The, the difference is, is I've noticed this, is that I think it's the, really the Cold War that did it. 
there's now an ideological or there was like this idea that we're going to be bipartisan news journalists, whatever, uh, that came out of the, we had to be unified in that way. And as soon as the nineties rolled around, everyone in the United States started fracturing again. And I noticed this with a few other groups, trust me in Canada and in Europe, newspapers have never had this objectivity before that we're all thinking of everyone, every different newspaper, so it's got its own personal yeah. little ideological hack. I mean, there's that great scene from Yes, Prime Minister, where it's like, I'll tell you what the newspaper is, uh, will do. This newspaper believes it is, uh, is owned, uh, it's read by the people who own the country. These, this newspaper is uh, read by the wives of the people who own, own the country. This, the, the Morning Star is read by people who think this country should be run by another country. <laughs> and to be fair, it is very difficult to write news with without showing your bias. I mean, yeah. um, then just the stories you choose to cover. Um, it, it's difficult. It really is. But I, I don't think they're making any effort anymore. And that, the problem that is, where do you get actual news? I, uh, um, a buddy of mine who worked briefly as a journalist, he was in um, Iraq, I think, first Iraq war, and he was in a hotel. And his only source of news was talking to other reporters, you know, yeah, because yeah. it wasn't safe to leave the hotel. So they all would drink and talk to one another. And and I, I think that you just sort of get in this loop of stuff and nothing new ever enters it. And, um, and that's all you hear. And that's why you can change the news channel at six o'clock. And it doesn't really matter which one you watch. They all have the same now, thing. There's actually, I, I think there's an interesting, very powerful effect here also with uh, respect to the photographs that accompany news stories, right? Um, and there's like so much trickery in the, in the photography. Um, so, for instance, um, Biden gave us a uh, speech yesterday in uh, Louisiana, Lake Charles, and um, as um, and all the photography about it was just close up on him. You didn't see the crowd of roughly zero people, and <laughs> and it was very close up on him, and there was no context at all delivered. Um, uh, another example, which I thought was which blew me away when I saw it was um, uh, details doesn't matter. Some left-wing group was protesting. Uh, well, some left-wing group was protesting at the opening of a Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. and I happened to go see it. <laughs> Those darn chicken and, sandwiches. <laughs> and there were, um, and what they did was something really interesting. They, there were a crowd of people here because um, people were happy to see this Chick-fil-A opening, right? Mm -hmm. So they were all there. And so what, the protesters did was they brought a banner on, you know, two PVC poles and, and a big banner, enormous banner. And they stood up in front of the crowd that was there and put up their banner and got photographed. Mm -hmm. So it, to anybody who saw that photograph, they're effectively labeling the crowd as on their side right. when the exact opposite is true. And you can see that in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the photography even is, is wildly biased. And powerful. Mm -hmm. And powerful. And mm -hmm. powerful. So, yeah, not, not only does it look like this big crowd is on their side, but the crowd looks normal, you know, like regular people. Right. <laughs> you know? So you can do that. If it, that's, a, it's a, that's totally a Linsky, right? Um, <laughs> it's a Linsky grade. Uh, but yeah, if you want to do something, bring a big banner, go in front of any random crowd, and you label the crowd, get it photographed. Good tip. And, and now you know, you'll see it. Now you know mm -hmm. to see it. And when you see like Biden in front of a crowd of zero people, you can tell because there's no pictures of the crowd. Right. I just love those pictures. So, um, yeah, it's a, a, it, news has always been biased. You know, has the news always been bought this way? Um, no, I don't think it's been. At least since as Walter as Cronkite, now. right? And, you know, old old time newspapers used to be called like the Cleveland Democrat or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, it used to be something. brutally biased. Yeah, they, and they were, yeah. uh, there was a name for it. Uh, David might remember. But um, uh, yeah, it was. Old journalism? Yeah, it, it's something like that. Yeah, I mean, it was just, yeah, the New York Post, New York Times, every town had two newspapers, one on each side. And, um, mm. and that was, you know, and I, honestly, I kind of like that. I mean, yeah. um, if they're just open about what they're doing, I, what I resent is when CNN presents themselves as neutral or Walter Cronkite depends to just 
then that's the way it is. You know, no, it's not. Walter. No, it's that's not what you want to think, you know. Um, so, in, but, yeah. Yeah. so in response to your, your question, um, what's going to happen? Um, you yeah, know, forget the news. That's not going to help us. Um, I see the current audit of the uh, voting of the vote of the ballots in uh, in Arizona to be very important because if they find that um, the wild difference between you know the uh, the wild number of, of bad ballots or you know, badly counted ballots or what have you or fake ballots uh, that kind of voter fraud is evidence of it. That's going to, I think that'll have a big effect. Um, and along those lines, um, the 2020 census came out yeah. recently and lists the, uh, the number of people who are voting. Yeah. It's wildly different than the Weird. voting yeah. voted tally. Just in the six, in just in the battleground states, which Joe Biden desperately needed to win. Strange, yeah. Strange well, no, all happened. states, all states. Um, mm -hmm. Because he did, you know, he, they gave him, the count was 81 million and which was his his votes were if you compare to the and I think maybe you meant maybe you quote would you one quoted me on this once if you compare it to the previous Democrat Party uh, vote no, tallies they were around around sixty million sixty million sixty million not suddenly 80, 81 million it's a twenty three percent increase out of yeah. nowhere with no explanation. No, you gotta understand your president, your current president is the most popular president ever. That's well, he's just an inspiring figure, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's a, yeah he's just twenty-three percent increase all of a sudden, with no explanation, no praising of a campaign strategy. There's no no campaign genius behind the whole thing. It all just well, very mysterious. I, I mean, you're right in that. Um, I, I I guess it'll matter if they find hard evidence of voter fraud but number one they won't I, I i can't believe that anybody's gonna let that happen um although I, who knows i guess but i also they don't think it'll matter for matching about uh, uh, of this audit they got a lot of other interesting audit things that will be interesting to see and would be good but my understanding they didn't allow signature matching and first off i'm sorry united states of america signature matching why is your country unable to go into the 21st century and have total be, ID? Because it's racist. No, and, it's and, not. And, and, and that's, and that's <laughs> and the beauty of racism. Racist, you, can, <laughs> you can take any problem you want, even if it's, in, in, uh, I wouldn't say uh, election incompetence. I think this is very competently done, but um, any kind of problem you want, just label as racism, right? So, so I, uh, but, 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 but setting that all aside, I, I, I think that, um, a problem here is that, and one reason I don't see an easy solution here is that, um, uh, you know, the left, you know, Portland's been burning for over a year. There have been riots all over the country for, you know, most of last year, and a lot of them are still continuing now. And, um, uh, but, you know, violence has always been a characteristic of leftist politics. I mean, it doesn't matter what country, what era, it's, it's just, it's, it's, uh, again, it's us against them, and it tends to get violent. Um, the, the um, but, but, the problem we have here, you know, you know, the leftists believe in using the power of government or of cooperative effort of collectivism or whatever. They believe in using these things to create a utopia um, here on earth. And, and thus, they, and then you can only achieve utopia if you can control the behavior and the thoughts of other people, because otherwise that might be the wrong thing, right? I mean, if you're allowed to buy uh, whatever light bulb you want, you might choose the wrong one. And if you, and if everybody buys mm -hmm. the wrong light bulbs, then it'll make global warming worse or, or whatever. And so, their love for humanity forces them to control humanity and you can't control humanity without using violence against humanity sometimes. And so you can sort of see where this leads, but, but that's okay. Cause you're saving the world. And that's, right. I think another place where they got the Republicans are evil thing from is, um, you know, we're not just talking about tax policy. We're trying to save the world here. Would you mind getting in line? And um, wh whereas you take conservatives and if they believe in individual thought and individual rights, um, you know, freedom of the individual uh, to, to do as and live as he pleases, I mean, if you believe in that, then you therefore must believe in allowing other people the same rights or else, I mean, if, if, an, if a conservative doesn't think other people should be allowed to have individual rights, then his rights won't last long either. And he knows that. Right. So, so, I, um, so I think the, the, well, hold the, the on. right has to, has to stand up at some point. Well, that, that's what and I'm getting at, Don, is that, is yeah. that you know, if, 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 if conservatives are by nature tolerant, which again, they kind of have to be or else they won't get to have rights for very long. Um, that, then the problem is, um, 
you know, like take, take suppose the left, the, the left uh, makes some kind of power grab. Like they say that they're going to pass a, a law saying what type of light bulb you have to buy. Okay. Conservatives will probably think that's they did. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, actually, that was the right who did that, as I recall. That was uh, George no, no. W. Bush's Republicans who did. H- I no, 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 no. The actual that's... legislation was a Democrat. Yeah, that, I, was, I, that was a the, that was a deal that you know he's. I'll give you this if you give me a bunch of other stuff. You know what I mean? But it was written. There's a law was written by Democrats. But anyway, so suppose the, the left makes some power grab and they say uh, about light bulbs, you have to purchase a certain type of light bulb. Um, conservatives will look at that and think, okay, that's a little ridiculous, you know, and they'll probably roll their eyes and you know that, uh, you know. It's, but really, is it really that big a deal? I mean, we're just talking about light bulbs here, and you know, I I, I don't like it. But am I going to go? burn down a convenience store over that um am i going to kill somebody over that i mean it is just light bulbs and i said if you tell you what leftists if you really feel that strongly about light bulbs fine whatever you know okay well th- so if conservatives can main continue to be this tolerant and and, and you know then margaret thatcher's ratchet effect just moves ever to the left and there's no there's no way to stop it and it's because you know if you take a leftist who is who says you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs and hey, it's us against them. And, and, and you know, and the, and the leftists will dehumanize their groups of opponents. Like if you have a leftist who doesn't like cops, um, you say, oh, okay, you don't like cops, but are, are you going to actually kill a cop over that? And say, yeah, p- cops are pigs, you know, they're dehumanizing. That, that, that police officer is no longer even a human being to that, that guy. I mean, right. at that point, and, and that is, that is a very different outlook than if you have conservatives who are by nature more tolerant of other people's views because we have different individual rights. So that means that in any kind of debate like this, conservatives tend to be weak and, and we tend to allow things to kind of slide along. And each thing that comes along, whether it's uh, gay marriage or light bulbs or, or, or whatever, um, we, you know, we say, is it really, is that the last hill worth dying on? You know, and, and, and conservatives will tend to say no. So yeah, if the conservatives ever stand up, that'll be a big deal. And I think that's what Brian was afraid of, that we were heading for a sectarian civil war. But I, myself, I cannot imagine what it would be that would actually trigger conservatives to actually stand up and, and say, we're not, no, absolutely not, and have us in the streets instead of Antifa. I, I mean, he's right, Guns. that'd be a force to be considered, but I can't imagine what would trigger that. Guns. Uh, p- now, that's one. That's <laughs> one. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you. Look at Virginia when they started pa- trying to, when the Democrats there tried to start passing really stringent gun. You start going door to door to confiscate guns. You know, you you got a hundred, knocking a hundred doors. A couple of those going to go badly. That's true, uh, but I, that's one reason no, I, don't I mean, think they'll like, actually. You you you're, you're forgetting the beginning of 2020 when the Virginia Democrats, who contr- finally had a supermajority on everything, tried to pass real serious gun control legislation in that state, and there were thousands of guys with guns at the legislature within a week <laughs> and nobody was hurt no one was hurt that was one I, I, surprise now thing. brian's point is that could easily go the wrong way and it could yeah it um, could. but I'm more than I, I'm just saying, say that, i can't but, imagine one of those guys pulling a trigger i, I just can't imagine it. but the democrats sorry, there's a better way go ahead there's a better way there's okay better. um first off these um the utopian ideas to say we're we're saving the planet we're we're, we're going to uh, we're, we're we're making things better the republicans have to stand up and say you're not smart enough to make things better you're not competent enough to make things better look at detroit that's what you've done that's what you've done after roughly 50 years which we do it, say things like that, but they don't. We really don't. Like the CNN. We, um, you know, we, we don't say it enough. We we don't say, okay. fix these problems you've caused first. Prove it to us that you're capable of solving the climate price Flint. problem, yeah. if there is. <laughs> Prove right. us first by fixing the problems previously, and that you previously caused. Okay, and we have to. I think we have to stand up and do that because that makes complete sense to anybody listening. Say it's saying, yeah, I, I'm, let's say, let's say we're embracing your concern. We're embracing your concern and you're, but you're claiming to be able to fix it. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a moment. I, and, I, and, it, and you're, and you're, and you're, you're doing this on bad faith. You have, 
you, you are just as evil if you're going to say you're going to make it better and make it worse. And I think that's um, the way to go. Um, as an example, we can look at all the climate uh, efforts, the, the pollution efforts we've had in the past that have failed miserably, right? You can think of the, um, the carpool lanes that have caused more congestion and thus more uh, less efficient use of, the, of, of, of gasoline and higher exhaust. You can think of um, the uh, MTB additive that was added to gasoline to make it, uh, to limit the uh, fumes, to limit the exhaust emissions, which had an effect of polluting the groundwater. You can talk about the overregulation of factory pollutants that moved the factory across the border to where there's no regulations and it pollutes 10 times as much. Every one of those, there are oodles of these. Every effort, it, it needs to have a metric of success. And if you look at those, um, you'll see it, every one of those is an example of being concerned to make this example. These are examples of the climate, like the oodles more. Every one of those made things worse, right? And so, um, for example, um, you brought up light bulbs. Light bulbs, uh, incandescent light bulbs, uh, have a low efficiency of like 5% or so, while uh, uh, the fluorescent lights are around 9% or so. And that sounds terrible, but in an incandescent light, as we know from physics, any energy that's put in that does not produce light produces heat. And if that contributes to heating the local environment in a good way, the light bulb becomes 100% efficient. Mm. It becomes 100% efficient and you can manufacture them with no pollutants whatsoever, right? As opposed to the fluorescent bulbs, which have mercury in them and the LED bulbs, which have all sorts of things in them. Yeah, it has so, mercury to get rid of them, yeah. Yeah, and so the, if in the cases, and most of the country most of the time appreciates having a little heat where the light is because um, most of it's pretty cold during the day and and there's this organic beauty about it because we have the lights on at night when it's colder and we have the lights on during the winter where they're longer nights and it's even colder it there's an organic balance to it that you can't get anywhere else well, look, Don, everything you say makes perfect sense, but the problem is you're evil, right? And, yeah. and, and so exactly. am I. And, and it's, so once they declare us as evil and once people believe that, it doesn't really matter what we, what we say about these things. And that's my concern. And that's why I'm kind of stressed out about this because I think, you know, once that, that takes hold, the, the, the Republicans really are evil, right? And they should not, you shouldn't, I mean, they should not be a welcome in polite society and their views should not be listened to. And then, so that means we can't talk about our, our differences. And then once ele suppose elections become compromised. And, and so I can't speak my mind and I can't vote my mind. And there's 75 million of us that feel that our democratic means of settling our differences has now become impossible. Once we can't use democracy to settle our differences, there is only one other way to control government. And that nobody wants that, right? Uh, at that point, you are left with violence. That's all there is. And and again, uh, to my way of thinking, conservatives are so far away from that, that that's not going to happen. I mean, there's right. not going to be a violent right wing right uprising against a left wing government. I just can't. I can't. I could be wrong. And I'm and Brian made a lot of very good points. I think but, the, yeah, because I think we kind of get sucked into national politics because that's the thing. And we look at, you know, they control the Senate and they got the Congress and they had the presidency. But look at the state legislatures. <laughs> The Democrats can't win down ballot. And that's where all the exciting, interesting things seem to be happening right now. Washington is completely paralyzed. One guy, the, the, I'm forgetting his name, but I really hated him, was the senator Biden? from West Virginia, oh. is now de facto president. Uh, Ma Manchin. Yeah, yeah, Manchin is now basically blocking the entire Democratic agenda because he just does, doesn't want to mean, he's like, don't do anything crazy. I don't want to do this. Well, you know, that, that, that's a really good point, David. And I've, and I've thought about that, that one way out of this, of course, is federalism. I mean, just let Texas do what they want, let yeah. New York do what they want. We already have federalism built into our system, but there's a couple 
problems that problem number one is um we have ignored federalism for decades you know it's, it's yeah. it, you're right in theory our country is a federalist system but that's not how it, the federal government is going to gain more and more power over time by distributing money and making hey, if you don't do what we want you don't get your money you pay your federal tax and you get no benefits back um so federalism has not been used here for a long time and then secondly i you know there was a really <laughs> So, so somebody on Ricochet commented that um, um, you know, about how there were um, towns or counties or somewhere that were declaring themselves sanctuary cities against Second Amendment violations, that if the federal government says we're going to confiscate guns, uh, we will not do that. And, and I, I was sitting there thinking, I said, OK, so let's see, how would that work then? So the, so the federal government would tell the sheriff's department in Abilene, Texas, to go confiscate people's guns. The sheriff would say no. So then the Biden administration would halt all funding for all projects in Texas and they, they wouldn't get any federal benefits. So then Texas would sue the federal government. So then you'd have- Or uh, Texas judge. could withhold their revenue that they send, which is apparently possible. I was reading a book years ago about a, an American civil, it's not a real civil war, but it started out like they got, they got it resolved before it could get really going in that regard. But Texas basically succeeded temporarily and yeah. they just stopped sending their money. And some people well, said a big cub at that, 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 that book is coming from Texas. That'll be very tricky. Uh, but, but re regardless, what I'm trying to get at though, is you have a judge looking well, at the case and he's saying, okay, so let's see now. So I've got a federal law, in this case, a, a, a second amendment of the constitution It's a federal document a federal law that says you have the right to bear arms. And I have a city or a county or whatever who says they're not, it's not that they're ref refusing to follow federal law. They are not stepping away from uh, like using federalism to say, we, we, we have our own laws, we're not listening to yours. No, that state is saying, we want to follow federal law. Uh, and then the federal government says, well, we're not following federal law. We're gonna confiscate those guns. And then the locals say, no, we, so, um, well, see, I'm getting confused even talking about this. Yeah, I, I don't understand exactly. how, don't worry about it. how does that work? I mean, so so federalism would be one way out of this, but it, but because the states that would be leaving the, the the United States, suppose they talk about secession, all they want is federal law back. They want to follow the laws of the yeah. United States. And then New York, Illinois, California don't. How do you leave a country when you agree with all their, I mean, I don't see how that works. And I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm just saying, I don't understand. Uh, it's kind of right. like, oh. the, uh, I, I can, a little answer on this. This happened actually in the United States before, slavery and the nullification rules where the federal government was passing these laws like the escape slave acts and states just refused to enforce them. Yeah, okay, that's a pretty good analogy. Yeah, that's really how the solution is here. It's sort of like, and, and what that, are you gonna do? Are maybe, you, you have an army to send down here to occupy all of Texas? And it led <laughs> to a war, but yeah, okay. Another thing is, uh, is that law doesn't really matter that much when you, comma, when you have selective enforcement. So true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Selective enforcement is much, law. that's a powerful tool right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then the law is whatever you say it is. It's like, you know, they call them uh, cafeteria Christians where you read the Bible and you believe certain parts of it, you don't believe other parts. And uh, so, you, so, and then that, may, that basically you're declaring yourself that, you know, I am God, you know, I decide what the real truth is. Um, you know, once you have a, a presidential administration decides laws, whatever we say it is, like if we say oh, the second amendment, you know, what do you say? Uh, all amendments are flexible or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Holy crap. I mean, you're, you're playing cards with somebody and they change the rules halfway through the game. That, that game is going to get really, really complicated. It's called and Calvin you're, Ball. You're, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. Did you have the reference? Uh, 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 are we talking Calvin about like Calvin and Hobbes? Yeah. 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 Then, yeah. It was. It was. It was yeah. a game he played with his babysitter, where he constantly changed the rules. <laughs> every, every frame was a different rule. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I so saw. I call it the political or legislative. I guess political Calvin ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, not a bad analogy for our current situation. And the, and the other thing is you make you generate so many crazy laws that you have to enforce them selectively. 
So yeah, it's a big uh, problem. That's true, but the flip side of that is like we say, oh, we need to pass an immigration law. We have very good immigration law. We just don't follow it, right? Right. Um, yeah. and, and that you could make that case with a lot of things we're doing here. It's not our, our legal. It, it's it's our courts, our judiciary, our you know, and that's the and that's another problem. The, the election stuff is. I don't care what they find. No judge is going to find that this election was fraudulent. You just can't do that. So um, you're right. Well, Dom, if you can't I, do that, let's go. <laughs> well, that's a whole other <laughs> com- go completely topic. Are you it is. Familiar? It is. I shouldn't even mention it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with uh, George Friedman? No. He's a geostrategist. Oh. He uh, found, was one of the founders of Stratfor, which was like this private intelligence organization, right? And... Uh, he wrote a book called The Storm Before the Calm. And I really recommend if you guys want to know what more he thinks is likely to happen in the next few years. He's, but he's basically pointed out that United States goes through institutional cycles every about 40 years. And you, we're just hitting one of those institutional cycles now. And the last one was really the end of the, the Roosevelt era, which was ended with Jimmy Carter and replacement of Reagan. There's always like a new president. There's one president that comes along and tries everything that the last guy that worked the last time to get them out of that crisis, like in the depression crisis. Uh, and it fails. And it looks like Biden's probably going to be the crisis, pre- the president that tries everything under the moon that worked 40 years ago and it's not the solution. And then the next president- didn't work 40 years ago. Uh, it was, yeah, the, it was like the, the, the fact that we needed, the United States really needed investment for credit, for investment and it was stuck in savings. It was kind of like the forgotten uh, decade in Japan. And the problem, right? It, it, one of his points though, is that the problem is in the United States is all the institutional is, are failing because everyone is, a very technical specialist, and there's no one who is like an everyman are in there. That's why the Supreme Court, I remember the Supreme Court right now, comes from two schools. Is that right? It's yeah. like wow. all nine of them. Like, that's great. It, like, I think one of them taught, uh, had his, it's like they all come from Harvard or Yale, and one of them yeah. has like a, a master's from Columbia. <laughs> that's it. And Versus you, you could never get someone like, say, Alan Dershowitz, who's considered one of the great lawyers in the, of the, his generation in the United States. He could never get a job on the Supreme Court because he's an actual guy who goes through uh, as a, a functioning lawyer. Mm-hmm. When was the last time you had a person who came up from the ranks as a prosecutor or a defense attorney who's been appointed to the Supreme Court? It's all these people who've clerked the right way and done the right, have all the connections. And that's who's getting that's there. And then the problem with elites is that the United States is that they're all coming from 10 schools and they all think the things. And traditionally what happens is they get replaced by a less ossified least. And hopefully well, it happens. It won't be so bloody as some of the other ones. I'm sympathetic to your point or the, the guy's point with the book that uh, we've been through times like this before. Uh, mm-hmm. We're likely to come out of it, but I, I do think this is different. If they can control elections, that's a difference. And now but they've controlled uh, elections before. Oh, now that's true. Did, did JFK win that election? Probably not, right? I mean, why do you bring, disagree? Did he did he really like Lyndon Johnson that much? I mean, no, he needed Texas, right? And mm-hmm. Lyndon Johnson knew how to cheat in Texas. He'd already done it before. So, cheat, you know, the left the left cheating in elections is not exactly a new concept. Or that, the right, but, from what I understand, it's really. Yeah, no, I understand. Talk to some people. Oh, David, please enlighten. I mean, that, that's why we kept saying Jimmy Carter, all these godforsaken places trying to institute leftism. Yeah, know. no, no, my understanding. Please give that, me an example. Uh, God, well, Rutherford B. Hayes, back in the day, 1876, I mean, Southern states that were Democrat were cheating, and also the right wing states were cheating. Uh, there was, there's uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, Nixon didn't contest the 1960 election is because his his guy his guys in the mob because the mob was split. Some were hired by the left and some were hired by the right, and they were uh, uh, doing some uh, shenanigans. So there is no historical shenanigans. Oh man, I I think you're uh, okay. Uh, I'll, yeah, I disagree with that. Yeah, it's fine, whatever. But but you understand my point, though, that yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm not sure that there are easy historical parallels to where we are. Because number one, yeah. I think elections might possibly be compromised. And secondly, mm-hmm. with again, with Democrats calling the other side evil, that limits the ability of the other side to participate in the political process. And, and it's going to be harder to bounce back from this, I think. Yeah. Another solution, one we haven't considered, is where the, uh, the Dems fight amongst themselves to such a degree 
that they split up or something. They fight amongst themselves instead of calling us racist. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, you look at it, single party states like Massachusetts and stuff. I mean, all the interesting stuff is internecine battles on the left and, and all the action happens in the primaries. And that's really where the course of state is determined is in the debates among other Democrats. That's true. But I, I just a thought. It, Consider it. It's a thought. It's a thought. There are I things that could happen. There's, you know, a, a foreign war that would that would stir things up, uh, yeah. uh, some type of natural disaster. There's a lot of things that could happen, which none of us want. Um, mm. But it, it's, I'm, I, I just sit here. I look at this. I just have no idea how this ends. I, I don't see an easy out here. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. It, because it'd be because fascinating to watch. Problems, it wasn't so horrifying. Because you know? mm -hmm. mm. one of the problems with the, the Dems, I think, is that they follow their their talking points so closely you know when there's a, when there's a, a vote in the congress they all vote together there's never anybody who who thinks independently the supreme court justices yeah. yeah and um they all work together because there's more power it's a group dynamic that. it's a tribe it's a, group right. it's, mm -hmm. it's a mob mm -hmm. a mob has power Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, on our our side, we have all these goofballs who try to be independent and try to prove that they're not part of the Republican Party. Yeah, and so right. Do the opposite. A and great so political weakness. Yeah, there was a great uh, 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 clip on YouTube of this guy that uh, this Democrat guy showed up at a, a protest um, about uh, transgenders or, or um, something like that. And this reporter walks up to him, sticks a microphone in his face, and says, "How many genders are there?" And he said. I don't know. I just got here. <laughs> and, and I thought that is perfect for the Democrat Party. You know, he, you know, whatever I need to believe in, sign me up. Um, I believe. And, and, and that's a lot harder if your party is based on respect for individual thought. Um, it's harder to get that degree of solidarity, which means our Supreme Court justices don't always vote together. Our, we have a lot more uh, arguing with the party that always <laughs> this league. I mean, it's uh, you're right. We are we were fighting from a position of political weakness because of the nature of our ideology, mm -hmm. and because of our people. We we have some people who just will re just refuse to work together. Now yeah, I do, I'm, I'm sorry. Just say uh, I think one of the solutions that is, uh, is actually happening and was something you mentioned earlier, Doc, is that you talked about how the left keeps going further and further to the left, and because they do that, they're leaving more and more of their coalition behind. And those guys are just going to vote for someone else. And I understand things are a little compromised right now, but uh, I think uh, even then, like the the one of the problems with this new uh, HR one House re Resolution one they wanted to pass is uh, that that would federalize the election system. My understanding is that in the states houses, all those guys hate it, Bec and the, the the bottom level Democrats because the current rules allow them a lot of patronage and pork, and it will blow up the current system at well the state you, level. you you we make just, a good you make a good point in that you know as the left as democrat goes further and further left there's a lot of democrats who are like union guys who ride harleys on the weekends that aren't really mm -hmm. true believers in the far out wacky stuff mm -hmm. oh. conservatives as evil mm -hmm. I, I just can't i don't think they're gonna have that many defections i maybe they will maybe they will and that may be our way out of this that's a good idea i hope you're right Mm. Well, Hillary Clinton got in trouble calling conservatives deplorable. So that, that, yeah, that well, now you can buy t shirts, right? Yeah, yeah I, I am t -shirt. A, a proud deplorable and all that. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. The deplorable. Uh, deplorable Neanderthal. <laughs> and, I, and I was um, heartened by all the, uh, uh, the, the lefties who uh, discovered what was going on and turned around the, and became spokespeople for the party, for conservatives or for Trump. Um, yeah, I'm thinking um, of people like uh, Brendan Strzok mm -hmm. um, and, um, and Carlin, uh, what's her yep. last name? Uh, um, Carlin uh, Borisenko yep. and yep. others. Have you, have you heard French. of her? David French, not quite. See, that's the problem, right? You know, I, um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And you know, the walk away movement and stuff. And, and, you know, and Trump did really well among Blacks, huge. Hispanics. And I mean, there, yeah. there, are, there are fissures in, in the, the foundation here. But Right. And, they, and they're great at their abilities to, to speak out and to explain and to get other people involved. Oh, they're yeah. wonderful. True. 
I yes, true. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm looking forward to the next round of uh, hopefuls. There's a lot of people coming up from the ranks. Trump in the end was kind of an imperfect embodiment of what I think we want to have in a uh, sense oh, yeah. leader. And it's like he surrounded himself with a lot of people who he didn't have a movement. He didn't have a lot of trust. And he surrounded himself with a lot of people who lived to stab him in the back. And uh, we're going to, I don't think just someone like DeSantis will have that problem. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, listen, yeah. if you're a Republican, somebody's going to stab you in the back. I mean, yeah. nobody is going to stand up and say that Biden is, nobody's going to leak in the Biden light. I mean, nobody's going to say, oh, Biden lost his dentures today. That's not going to get out. I mean, um, that is it. Uh, and you're right, our next leader will be imperfect as well, because we're kind of critical of our leaders. We don't worship our leaders the way the left does. Um, mm, thank God. They don't. Oh, true. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying it's political Biden. weakness, though, right? Because because it's Don said. I don't know if it's necessarily a political weakness. I think it's a political strength. Sometimes it look it looks to the left. The left thinks it's a strength, and but it doesn't always really work out for them as well. Yeah, we have more ideas on our side, right? Because we're allowed to speak to one another, and we're all allowed to think. And you know, guys like us can sit around and chit chat about stuff that doesn't really happen on the left very much. So. Yeah, and they get stagnant. You have intellectual stagnation over there. But in terms of gaining power, just pure, cold, bloody power works pretty well. I'm not too sure about that. I just look at them like they, they're barely holding on by their fingernails by the looks of it to me. Yes, do they have the Senate? They barely have the Senate with like they have to get Trump and Kamala to do it. Uh, they got the House That's by the, like a three seat majority or, or something. The presidency, well, in order to keep that president in power, there's 25,000 troops surrounding him at all times. It does not <laughs> yeah. send strength, that's, that's, strength or strength. That's true. Although, if they're governing such a position of weakness, why are they proposing all this wildly far out stuff? And the only, re- the only reason I come up with, I mean, they'd either have to have an enormous uh, majority and they don't care what anybody thinks, or they think they don't need to stand for election. They, they, they think, think they're just vote whatever the heck they want and they can win the next election because they know it's going to turn out right, right? Those are the only two things I can think of. I know they don't have a big majority. They're mm-hmm. governing as no, if there are no consequences. Because right. Des- and I, think I, I see you can see the strength. I see that as desperation. They think they, they'll never have another chance maybe. to do it again. Fair enough. Maybe. Maybe. But, um, I, I hope well, you're right. I think, well, I, I think they have the system where they just hand stuff to Biden to sign and it happens. And Biden is not I, you know, I, I, I'm, I swear, this is John Gill from that Star Trek episode. Yes. Um, it's, it's exactly the same. And he's, you know, barely conscious. And they're just having him sign, they're holding his arm, signing. He does almost there. have some influence. They did manage to get him. He, I think he is the one who prevented war with Russia. I think that was the thing when they kind of came in and said, what are you idiots in the National Security Council doing? Why is Russia about to take over all of Ukraine? <laughs> They were ready to go. That, and if they had cro- crossed the, the, the Donbass, they weren't stopping until they got to Kiev. <laughs> and probably be so I don't think, you know, I don't think Biden's aware. I think I just, and they have all these groups that are going to take advantage of that, that, <laughs> that um, fire hose mm-hmm. of putting stuff through. He just put stuff down that hole, the Biden hole, and it just, he signs it. And so there's no, um, there's no regulator mm-hmm. on that. Hey, I'm get, it's getting late. Yeah, yep, that's been pretty good. So do we have anything kind of we want to go out on a good note? Uh, yeah, I've been really good for that today. I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. It's been great. No, it's been super side. interesting. Uh, you, your last question, can this trend toward perpetual leftist control of America be reversed? How? There's lots of ways I think it's I lo- happened. I'm sorry. Oh, you, I didn't hear that. Sorry. You, the last thing, you, your question here was... Uh, can this trend toward perpetual leftist control of America be reversed and how? And I think we can all come up. I know there's different ways that we can probably come up with like one idea between the three of us. I'm hopeful with the internet still not, I understand big tech's uh, big tech right now, but I think uh, I was watching uh, Mike, uh, David Rubin the day after they kicked Trump off the internet and they had Michael Malice on and he said, why are we all on, I understand everyone's upset that they kicked them off, but why are we all on one platform? Why do we all, why does this idea that we all have to be like the 1980s when we have three TV stations? 
I'll, uh, I'll, I'll piggyback on Don's point that uh, one thing that could change this would be a complete self-destruction of the left, mm -hmm. um, that it is a power-hungry organization. There's a lot of people in there that want power. And, you know, now they have all the power. And if they do control elections, they have a lot of power. And that might lead them to govern in such a way that they might lose popularity with some of their traditionally supporting groups. And uh, if they do lose, say, half the black vote, um, oh my gosh, you know, so it, it, presuming we have elections. You know. So um, if the left does a poor job managing itself while, and it is hard when there, when there is no opposition, it can be hard to maintain control over everybody. So a, a self-destruction left that, that would, that could happen. Yeah. I mean, look at what happened with Portland. Uh, I think it was where it was Mayor Ted Wheeler. And he goes out in front of the mob and there he's like, yay, we're all here. And then the mob leader turns him and now you're going to defund the police. And he's like, what? <laughs> but, but I can't do that. That's all our stuff. Right. <laughs> and, yeah, there was a... and, and that's the, the solution. They're, they are going to eat their own, I think, before. There was an actor in Baltimore who was shot. Uh, he was just shot in the ear. It was like a drive-by shooting at, at Grayson or something. And he was all pissed off. I said, we, we can't have no police on the streets of Baltimore. And that um, something like that happened. You know, Tom Brokaw walking down the street in Manhattan and dies in a drive-by shooting, you know, which nobody wants. Nobody wants. But you're mm -hmm. right. Things could happen that could change people's view of some left leftist policies. We start to see the consequences of these policies. Uh, people may start to back away, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, I think we've seen it in Detroit and St. Louis and Baltimore. And, Which still revolt reliably de Democrat, by the way, but yes, that's true. Yeah. Right, and uh, just remember, the 1970s were a pretty awful time, and then Ronald Reagan came along and fired all the air traffic controllers. And because he was good again. He won an election. They had an election. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Hey, folks. We all right. Go. I got to. I got to yeah. go. Thanks, thanks guys. I really it's been a great it. 50, and I can't. We'll see you in another 50. All right. See you then. Okay. 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 Bye. Good. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.